Welcome to Podcasting Power Hour with your host, Jeff Townsend, a.k.a. The Indie Podcast Father. I'm your co-host, Greg, from Indie Drop-In Network. Podcasting Power Hour is recorded live every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Twitter Spaces. Every week, an experienced panel of podcasters and other experts will tackle your podcasting questions. We will, of course, put links to all of our guests and any relevant information in the show notes. All right, let's get this party started. All right, welcome to Podcasting Power Hour. I'm Jeff Townsend. Joining me is my first officer. He is aged but very wise. Greg, founder of Indie Drop-In. What's going on, Greg? Team, how's it going? It's going to be a good show. I I appreciate the uh, whiskey talk. And then, you know, I mean, you crushed it so harshly. I mean, I even felt a little bad for Ed, which has never happened. So <laughs> thanks for a new experience. Oh, we love Ed. He just gets... He gets into the moment. So, uh, no introduction needed for Ed. Uh, Jim Mallard, thanks for joining us. Mallard Report live every Tuesday for a. Have you how, have you been doing it live the whole time? Yep, that's why I keep doing it live. Ten years going live. Wow, that's that's impressive. And well, your podcast is about any and everything, so I guess you could do that for ten years. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> It saves a lot of trouble, makes a lot of trouble. Anyways, yeah. True, 10 years, you're going to run out of something if you're just doing one thing, right? I mean, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, for sure. 10 years, you might run out of clean drinking water. That was a Colorado joke. <laughs> we'll segue into you, Tanner. The man that has his listeners go to about eight different platforms <laughs> It's Tanner Campbell. Where are we at this week? We're on Circle, right? Yeah, we're on Circle this week. Next week, What's I'm going to move you to Slack, and then we'll go to, I don't know, whatever the next derivative of Discord is. We'll go to that. I don't like that you said Greg was old but wise. I feel like what you meant to say was he was old and wise. Eh, he said, he said. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. No problem. And, of course, we have, you know, a lot of people out. Dave Jackson has a date, I think, and uh, Ariel Nissenblatt is busy, and just a lot of people tied up this evening. So, Greg picked an interesting topic that I'm excited to discuss. I'm not sure where he's going to go with it exactly, but you want to come up and go ahead and speak. Feel free to request the mic. And, of course, there's a comment section down below. I'll pass it off to you now, Greg. Oh, thanks so much. Well, you know, this is going to be, you know, hopefully people will come up and, and ask some questions or or challenge this, but it'll be good for the podcast version of this show. But um, I spent about two hours today um, looking for shows, curating shows for my new TV movie fandom uh, shows that I just announced. And at least half of them, if not more than half of them, opened up the show and maybe I listened to maybe 10 minutes. Um, they didn't say the, their name, their show name what they were going to talk about in the episode, what the show is about, um, which, you know, what makes them special. So as a new listener, you know, you might get sucked in by the, the cover art or the description, or somebody might tell you it's good, but you've got no sort of connection, no sort of understanding of what the heck is going on in the show. So I put a tweet out about it and, you know, it's, it's been getting a little bit of attention. So I thought it would be a good topic to start this space. Jeff, there's a flip side to that too, though, Greg. And I think uh, Brian Barlett is listening. He actually got me on this when he listened to my podcast for the first time. Well, I guess it's been over a year, but the time it takes to actually get to the content, whether, whether or not, you know, I mean, even if you know what it's going to be about still timely manner of transitioning into that content. And I know you and I have talked about that as well, Greg. Yeah, I think you always want to get into the content fast, but I also want to know like who you are, what what you know, what makes your show special. Um, what are you going to talk about today? If it's if it's a show where I'm going to learn some things, maybe give me some tips of what I'm going to learn. Um, you know, kind of get me excited about the show. And I think there's all sorts of things about podcast hygiene that come into play, but this is one that, I mean, 
if I looked at 20 shows, more than 10 of them just kind of started. Maybe they even had music. And if they did, the music went on too long. <laughs> but it was never yeah. good. Game of Thrones length uh, intro music. That's always the best. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe we can just start with some best practices of opening the show. And, and you know, it's hard to say there's hard and fast rules because there's <clears> not. But there are some things that are known to work if you don't have anything, if you don't have any like grand ideas. Well, I mean, an emerging kind of, I would almost say now a stereotype of intros is the cold open, right? I mean, I mean, I do it. I'll do it maybe five seconds of, you know, good morning podcasters today. We're going to be talking about this, that, and that, and that's up next. And then music. I feel like more and more people are adapting cold opens and I, I like them. I think they're pretty effective. They're what I suggest as to most of my clients or most newbies who come to me, like let somebody know what they're about to invest, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes of their time in so they can make the decision to get the fuck out quick if they want to. And uh, that'll do two things. It'll set their expectations, make them happy and let them abandon if they want to. But it'll also probably cut down on the kind of reviews that are like, Jesus Christ, I had to wait 40 minutes to find out I didn't want to listen to this fucking episode. Yeah, or the bargain that your episode description and episode title made with the listener you didn't start paying that back right away, right? Oh, maybe I love it's that. somewhere. Bargain. That's that's great. You know, maybe it's somewhere in your episode, but like it, you haven't gotten to it in a point where I have my attention span, and maybe there's no chapters, right? The list goes on and on and on. What do you What do you think, Jim? I know you uh, half of your intro is trying to figure out how to get it streaming live. <laughs> <laughs> well, some nice, Jeff. I guess but this is the fun factor for me. Even though I've been doing it live, I've much approached it from the podcast format of introducing my guests off the top and then not resetting like you would in your traditional radio format every half hour, 20 minutes, whatever, which leads people who join the live show confused. But if you're listening to the podcast, you've heard all that. But I, I think you have to do it off the top and you have to tell people the name of the show and who you are. I mean, yes, I know you're clicking in, but if somebody sent it to you and you just click it because Greg sent it to you, and you just bring it up and you start listening and you don't know what the world you're listening to, you're not going to gain the attraction that way because you're going to listen to whatever and then not realize it's a show and just not subscribe or not pay attention to it. There is somewhat of a delicate balance, though, here, right? I mean, you've got to strike, you've got to strike a balance between being far too repetitive to people who listen every day or, you know, every episode and being informational enough to the new listener who's just touching down and discovering your podcast, which is supposed to be right. The purpose of the trailer, but I don't know. I'm kind of curious as to how many people actually, I don't know that I've seen any data on this, but how many people actually, when they first come to a podcast, instead of playing the first episode, play the trailer to discover whether or not the trailer is any good. It's the first thing they're presented with an Apple podcast, but I wonder how much traction it actually gets. Mine doesn't get a lot of traction on practical stoicism. Usually it's the, you know, one of the first episodes. Nobody ever listens to the trailer. It's one of my least listened to episodes. Yeah. Same for all of my shows. The trailer is very low listens. I don't focus. I need to focus on the trailer more. I focused on that just to get an RSS feed. How terrible is that? I don't have a trailer. <laughs> so I Go ahead, Ed. Well, I, I finally put a trailer up uh, two months ago, same week as I put up a new episode, and the trailer ended up getting more plays the first week and the first month than the brand new episode, maybe because it was only 30 seconds long, and that's all people could handle listening to me blabble on about my own show. But uh, the trailer's actually been pretty effective, and I've seen my uh, download numbers increase exponentially since I put it up. So I'm, of course, in the opposite boat of everybody else who's an expert. No, no. I, I think we're talking like, let's say the topic of today's power hour is just podcast hygiene. A trailer is absolutely podcast hygiene. So I'll give you some stats since I have it up. I know people love stats. So my true crime show, let's just say just for round numbers, it gets 10,000 downloads in the first 30 days. My, my trailer has gotten 13,238 downloads in its lifetime. Um, and it's, you know, whatever it is, two years old, but it gets about, it got 543 downloads in the last 30 days. So 
that's why I call it hygiene because people, people are listening to it and it's likely converting listeners, which 543 in a month, if it converted a 10th of that, you know, I would pay 150 bucks for that. Yeah, I, I'm actually, I'm actually tempted because I see Brian in the audience. I'm tempted to have Brian try to put together some sort of additional data for the creator's report that Sounds Profitable did, which by the way, if you all haven't checked out, you should at soundsprofitable.com. That's a plug for you, Brian. Checks in the mail, I hope. Uh, to to add in like how much of like how much use that um, that trailer is getting. But at the same time, I'd be afraid that if the data came back that the trailer didn't get a lot of use, that people would stop making them. And I think that would be, to your point, Greg, kind of harmful overall, because maybe it's not doing work for 70 or 80 percent of your community uh, or potential listenership, but it is doing some serious work, it seems, for at least, you know, some percentage of it. And when it's working, well, you're kind of glad you have it. Yeah, I I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, So what do you think are the important elements of a trailer? I mean, mine is a, it's a highly produced um, kind of teaser, I'll say, with some narrative from me basically telling you, you know, striking the bargain is what I like to call it. Um, So it strikes the bargain and then gives you some samples, basically. And um, I've probably changed it 10 times. And this is my favorite iteration based on um, looking at the uh, retention data. Mm. But um, I did get hassled because I had dynamic ads on it. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. You would. You would. I would. I didn't just would. I did. So <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> at least, you didn't do it on purpose. Did you lose an accident? Yeah, no, no. When I moved over to Spreaker, I pressed the button that said, like, add it into my back episodes, and, and I was stupid, and I didn't check it. You pressed the easy button, you fool. Uh, always the easy button. I'm a sucker <laughs> for tech. Uh, I, th- I don't know. I think the anatomy of a trailer, Brandon Ushio is a friend of mine. He runs the fandom podcast called, it's called fandom. It's not the fandom podcast, it's just the name of it. And uh, he has a great little document about the necessary anatomy of, of a podcast trailer. And specifically, it depends on what stage you're at. So like, obviously the anatomy of a podcast trailer for a start is who you are, what your expertise is, what the publishing schedule is, uh, what days things come out, what the runtime is, you know, why you're doing this and what you're passionate about. You know, it's like two to three minutes long and it just kind of delivers the, look, we're just starting and here's what you can expect. Here are the expectations we want to set. But it sounds like, I mean, especially for somebody like you, Greg, who's been, who's been doing this for a while, eventually you re, you iterate on that and then you reiterate on it and you make it better and better and it becomes a super cut of all the best moments. I personally think that that's what a podcast, um, I think it sh- a podcast trailer should lead out with, hey, this is the, the, it's about this and this, and then slide into Supercut when they can, because I think that does a lot to kind of, I, I don't want to say like form a relationship instantly, but usually when things are fun and sharp and fast, like people can, I don't know, people tend to, those Supercuts really do something, at least for me, when I'm thinking about listening to a new podcast, it's usually the trailer that sells me on it and how much effort they put into it. But I think also you should iterate on these things frequently. I think your podcast trailer should always be changing, like maybe quarterly. I know I redo mine about every three months. Yeah. If you use seasons, you know, there's some trickery you can do with uh, trailers for seasons. Um, but you might have to, whenever you update your trailer, there's a little trick where if you call your podcast host and you have them change the GUID, in the RSS, it'll show up as you new. are not in IT and just didn't call that a GUID. You called it a GUID. That's what I call it, dude. Oh my God almighty. It's a GUID. Stop it. I, I, listen, I was around when it was invented. So you can <laughs> be you quiet. Call, when you called it a GUID, a GUID. Yeah. Yeah. So, and breakfast tacos have eggs. So I'm going to school you on all sorts of things today, Tanner. But, uh, so you call them and have them flip it so that it comes up new in the apps and some will, some won't, but uh, it depends on your, if you have a good host, they, sh- they should accommodate uh, worst case scenario, delete the entire trailer and then re recreate it because then it'll, then it'll do it in the RSS on its own. But a um, little trick just so that it shows up new in people who's listened to it. So they know it's a new trailer. 
You've used the word hygiene a couple of times. I'm wondering when you, you update your trailer on a somewhat regular basis, when you do that, for the sake of data, are you, and this is genuine, I'm not trying to set you up for a smart answer. I'm curious as to what you do. Do you swap out the episode as in delete the old one, create a new trailer, mark it as trailer, it's a new trailer, or do you just swap out the audio for the same thing that you've marked a trailer since the beginning? So um, I can't get Spreaker to change uh, the GUID. So um, I delete the trailer and recreate it and it does it automatically in the RSS. Um, But, um, you know, if you, if you have a lot of information in your show notes of your trailer, or you have a lot of stats that you want to keep, which is the biggest problem when you delete that, um, you know, or you could, I guess technically you could flip it to a regular episode and it's so far back that no one would ever know. Um, so there's, I mean, there's a couple of things that you could do if you wanted to keep the stats, but I delete it and I added an, I add a new one so that it shows up new in people's apps because I don't run seasons. So, uh, I, I'm just seeing this. Brian Barletta sent me a message that says uh, one of his primary concerns about, tra- hold on, let me read it verbatim so that I'm not trying to remember. Um, the issue with a trailer is that not all apps show them, which is 100% true. Uh, most apps, I would say, don't show them. So maybe that accounts for why the listenership on them is so low when compared to, you know, what an episode would be in a given month. Yeah, and that's why I just consider it hygiene because it's, uh, you know, I, it's like, you know, some of the podcasting 2.0 stuff. Like if, you're, if your host supports it, you put it in there for hygiene because there's apps out there that do support it. But um, it's not one of those things that's going to make or break your podcast, I don't think. Although Spotify shows the trailer right up on top really nicely. So if they're the king, you should have a trailer. So, I mean, what are the things with the trailer? Like, are you trying to, what's the selling point? Would you say, Greg, what are, what are some of the most important things aside from the hygienic things that you're mentioning today? Yeah, no, I think, I think Tanner hit it, hit it pretty close, right? Um, what I try to do is I try to make a connection with the listener first. So I never say, welcome everybody. I always say, you know, I speak to the individual, which is kind of a trick that, that you do in sales. <laughs> and, um, and then I try to talk about what they're going to get if they invest their time in it. So for, for my shows, it's, you're going to get exposed to a new indie creator every week. And here are some awesome ones that you've missed. And I'll play, you know, some clips of some highlights of some of the standout shows. And uh, hopefully they'll get a little FOMO and they'll subscribe. So that's, that's my goal. My goal is to be personable, tell them what they're going to get, show them some FOMO, and then hopefully get a subscribe. Obviously uh, ask them to subscribe. So it, it's not unlike a YouTube trailer, right? YouTube trailers kind of do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now you, YouTube trailers are, are a different story because you have to actually go and find them. But, um, but yeah, I would do the exact same thing on a YouTube trailer. Jim Mallard, let's see you. Don't be afraid to speak up, buddy. Well, I, I don't have a YouTube, uh, YouTube trailer or a podcast trailer, so I'm just kind of sitting here debating and trying to figure out how I'm going to um, – well, I probably never get there. I'm just lazy. So I love the anxiety that we've just given Jim that <laughs> he's been doing this for a decade, and now well, he has you know, to it's figure like out how to build some trailers, trailers. Or all this new shit. It's just like you guys – Well, no, it's just the idea to- that – we're talking about a supercut, and now you have ten years of supercut to go through and figure out. That's a fresh hell, yeah, man. I, I wouldn't want to be in that position. How long are these stupid things supposed to be? Because I've got, I've tried to figure out who I'm cutting. Literally, who I'm <laughs> you have cutting. a thirty-minute trailer of supercuts. <laughs> My, mine is a minute, just so you know. <laughs> Your trailer's a minute. Yeah, like it might be like a minute, fifteen seconds, something like that. Like what? What? In your opinion, is the perfect length? Is there one necessarily? One where where people stay the whole time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. As long as it needs to be is like always the answer. Don't go on too long where and you're just kind of like trying to fill some arbitrary timeline, but also don't get it short so that people walk away without enough information. That's my same advice for like any podcast episode when you're trying to figure out your format. 
not so long that you've got to fill it with fluff to hit that arbitrary limit, but also not too little that people walk away going, well, shit, I kind of wanted more than that. Well, I had an author friend that told me that he writes a hundred thousand words so that his book is around 80,000 words. And that's how I feel about all podcasting. Yeah. If you're out there listening, don't be afraid to uh, request to speak and chime in on what your opinion on this is, or if you have, anything else we want to discuss. Yeah. Let's, let's circle back since we're kind of focusing on podcasting hygiene, right? I don't want to call this best practices because best is subjective based on your, you know, if your audio fiction or something else. But, um, so we talked about the trailer, let's circle back to the cold open and the intro. What do you think the components, what do you think the winning components of a cold open are as far as length and what you're trying to do? Tanner, you have them. So, yeah. Or, or, yeah. So uh, what do you do? I mean, I, it's not unlike a trailer, which is funny uh, because you're trying to escape us talking about trailers this whole time. <laughs> so, but it's not unlike that. It's, I want to, as quickly as possible, give you information about what you're about to commit your time to so that you don't commit the time in vain and give me a one-star review or hate my show or waste your time and feel like you didn't get anything out of it. And, you know, talk about this podcast, you heard this sucks. Um, people obviously have a tendency to talk about things that piss them off more than things that make them happy, make them happy. So, you know, the, the risk of a one star review over the benefit of a five star review with with cold opens is, or trailers is probably higher. Um, but but yeah, I, tr- I try to say again, not, not to plug my own show here, but, you know, good morning podcasters. Today, we're going to be talking about this. We're going to dive into this after that. And that is up next. I mean, they don't last um, I assume some of you guys who are co-hosting with me listen to the show or maybe it's just my mom listens a bunch. Uh, it's probably seven seconds. I mean, one of the things that's a huge turnoff to me, and this is potentially because I am a podcaster, because I'm an audio engineer, so I can be, and I have been accused of being an elitist in this way, and I totally accept that label. I absolutely am. Um, I'm impractical in some ways when it comes to production. Uh, but I, I hate, I hate listening to intro music for longer than maybe four seconds before I hear someone's voice, like a 60 second bunch of music. I made the joke about the Game of Thrones intro, but I mean, that's what it feels like. Anybody who watched that show knows that, you know, as you went on along in seasons, that, that intro just kept getting fucking longer and longer and longer. Uh, and you know, it's terrible to sit through something for 60 seconds only then to find out that maybe you don't like the the host's voice, which is, you know, happens. You don't like uh, the co-host voice. You don't like the tone. You don't like the content at all, but it took you a minute to figure it out. And, you know, that can irk some people. I don't, I don't, I'd rather not do that. My girlfriend's throwing, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, anyway, that's that's my feelings on it. Not, not, not very long, less than 10 seconds, maybe, if you can manage it. She's saying you earn your one star reviews with your shining personality. That's what she <laughs> just that's, said. That's not untrue. So, Jeff, you don't do a cold open. You do kind of a standard show intro. Why do you do the intro that you do? Uh, I guess just I could do either or, but it's just consistent and it's been easier, easier for me, per se. Um, I just, you know, go with the music then then kind of into it, but I don't know. That's a really good question. Actually. I just think consistency is maybe what I'm comfortable with. I've, I've tested, um, a couple of different variations of intros, um, <clears throat> over the years. And I think as long as the cold open is at least for me, when it's less than maybe a minute um, and then it gets to the, the regular intros, the intro music and what's the show about and all that stuff. Uh, it seems to be okay for retention, but I didn't notice any difference between a cold open and just getting right into the intro. Now on my very first show, um, the show where I met your, your friend, Brandon Tanner, uh, my very first show, um, we were horrible at the intros. We would just get right in it. You know, we were, it it was, it was one of those things where, you know, you, you take cues from expert podcasters where you, they, they're already famous and they don't need introductions and things like that. So we were trying to, 
kind of go that way. And our retention numbers were terrible. Like people would drop off in three minutes and five minutes. And as soon as we nailed the basic intro, who we are, why we're here, what the show's about, our, our uh, retention numbers immediately jumped to like average 60%. And then we could start, we could start iterating on content and, and speed of the show and segments and all different things that help retention. But, um, you know, we were losing probably 25% of our audience in the first five minutes before we got our intro sorted. You know, who does a really good job of this, um, is Drew Toynbee and his crew. Uh, they're based in the UK. They have a podcast called um, Sequel Pitch. And the premise is that they take a movie that doesn't have a sequel and they pitch sequel ideas to each other. It's quite funny. Um, and in every, they, they kind of open almost like a game show where they say, welcome to Sequel Pitch, the podcast where we take movies that don't have a sequel and pitch ideas to each other. In the same way that you say, you know, like, welcome to Hollywood Squares, the game show wherein this, this, and this happens. And I think they do a terrific job of it. And it doesn't, even though it is extremely repetitive to anybody who's heard it, it never comes off that way. And I, I'm a regular listener at this point, and I'm never annoyed by the fact that they say it because it seems, I don't know, something about it. They just nail it. They get it exactly right. Well, it sounds dynamic. That's why it, it works. Yes. Now, yeah. in my case, I have my minute of intro music with my uh, disclaimer and a little bit about the show, because as Jeff knows, he, he loves to point out that when you're going live, you need that extra minute there to make, every show, make sure everything is live. So there's always that fun little twist. But otherwise, I, I don't know. So that kind of throws a wrinkle in my production plans. But So, Jim, you don't, you don't create an intro for the podcast version of your show? No, like, I use the same one. Oh. What you hear is what you get. I, I don't uh, – well, I have edited, but I have only really limitedly edited things out because uh, – based on content because, well, some guests are idiots. And I, I do reserve the right to uh, edit some of that stuff because, well, it was horrible. But, yeah, so I just run the music and start talking and run the outro and post it up and, well, eventually get the blog post. Ugh. Anyways before I get myself in trouble. <laughs> hey, Ed, what do you do on your show? Like, do you, cause I know you recently, uh, you know, you played with the name of the show, but do you, do you change your intros at all? I, I've, I've had probably five intros over the past three years. Um, just as I grow as a podcaster and as I meet people, um, who are much better at this than me and, uh, just listen to other podcasts. Um, I kind of, I'm a creature of habit. So once I get into something, uh, a certain groove, I like to stay in that groove. But uh, the the intro that I have now was was partially created uh, at the suggestion of a listener who was actually, well, more specifically a podcast critic uh, going to one of our other topics on Twitter this week. But uh, they said, hey, you know, I, I love what you do with the show, but maybe since your um, your podcast is about movies, maybe have a sound that signifies something that you know everybody knows is related to movies. So, going off of that, um, I, I, I actually went to an old theater where I knew they still had projectors and I actually recorded projector sounds so that I could integrate those into. The intro. So I think the intro itself of just the, the sound of the projectors and the, the film going through the projectors with the five, four, three, beep, beep, beep. I think that only lasts like seven seconds. And then I go right into, you know, you know, hello and welcome to the 80s movie podcast. I'm your host, Edward Havens. And then I do a little call to action and then I just get right into it. So I think I'm, I'm off and running within 60 seconds. Um, but yeah, I just I was looking for something that was just felt like a movie right out of it, and it took me about a year and a half, two years to finally get it. I really love one of the things I appreciate appreciate about you, Ed, is just how dedicated you are to the craft in general, and I, and I mean that in most everything you do. the The idea that you wouldn't go to a sound effects factory to get what is probably a very easy sound effect to find. And that you would instead go hunt down a theater that had old fashioned projectors and record that sound to use it so that it was 
truly your own and very authentic. I really appreciate that about you, man. No, I appreciate you as well. Thank you for that. Podcasting Power Hour is part of Indie Drop-In Network. If you are a podcaster looking to grow your listeners, check out IndieDropIn.com. Indie Drop-In is always free, and we have opportunities right now for comedy, true crime, scary, and paranormal podcasts. Just go to IndieDropIn.com to learn more. Interesting enough, Greg, when you challenged me what I was doing with that, you know, getting into that next step, that introduction before whatever conversation I'm having, I, I didn't notice the change that I made by cutting down a little bit on the time. I didn't notice any change in retention or anything. Interesting enough. Really? That's, I yeah, mean, no, it, it's, it's, that's why you test things, right? Yeah, no, no. I mean, I heard some feedback, you know, positive and negative about it, but I, and, you know, like Brian Barletta brought it up, but I've never, I didn't see a difference when I've made changes. It's just stayed consistent because that was one thing I really wanted to see and there was no change. The feedback's also kind of hard to trust, right? Like I talk a lot about setting expectations with your listeners so they know when changes are going to happen, for example. And on a podcast I have, I recently said, hey, I just want to let everybody know there's been a, you know, something's happened and there's going to be this change to the way that ads are delivered on my show. And sure enough, like clockwork, I mean, no other listener said it, but you're going to get the one review and you're going to, you know, give undue weight to that single review. Somebody was like, man, I get it. Like, can you just not talk about ads and just get to the fucking content? And I was like, God damn it. you can't make anybody happy. Well, I think it's your same comment about you got to optimize for both the new listener and the existing listener. Yeah, that's right. right. I'm, I'm sure that long intro, Jeff, was probably annoying the crap out of your existing listeners, but you had fans. So they just dealt with it, you know, like skip intro on Game of Thrones. Um, I feel like but, when podcasters are your listener too, though, there's, it's kind of like uh, the rules are a little bit different. I know that sounds messed up, but. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I mean, they know you, they, they try to, you know, they're trying to get something from, from you. So they're going to hit next, next probably on your, or, you know, fast forward 15 seconds or 30 seconds on, on this stuff. I know that's what I do. No offense, but I'm like, skip, skip, skip. Okay. Here we go. It's no honor among podcasters. <laughs> I just skip everybody else's ad. It's terrible, right? No, no, not the ads. The, oh. ads, the ads are mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no, it's just the, uh, um, you know, like Jeff has a different podcaster do his intro for him. So what I'll do is I'll hear who that podcaster is. And I go, oh, I'll know them. Skip. You know, or for somebody I don't know, I'll go, huh, I wonder what they're, you know, like it just depends. I'm not one of those psychos that has overcast set to skip 30 seconds on every podcast. I, I, I pictured you being that guy. Does overcast no. have that feature? It just auto skips ads. It doesn't auto skip ads, but you can, you can start podcasts at like two minutes in or something. God, there's such a tension between the players that serve the listener and like everything else we're trying to do to help creators. I feel like podcast players are not on our side most times. Yeah. That's why we got good pods. JJ in the house. Sorry, I couldn't mention over overcast without good pause. I have to balance the scales a little. Yeah, for sure. What else are you thinking, Greg? Anything else you want to kind of, I mean, this is a huge topic, just the hygiene part, but. Yeah, no, I think so. So then there's another, there's another part of the cold open that, that hopefully some folks have some input on, but what about the, the best of the episode cold open, right? It's not, it's not, Hey, you know, this is Tanner. We're going to talk about this. It's a clip from, from the middle of the episode. Like, let's say it's a true crime show. It's like she opened the door and she saw the knife hit her face or whatever. You know, hit her like, face. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Just like side of the blade smacked her in the face. Well, yeah. I what mean, true you, crime, what true crime are you listening to? Right? Well, that's not the crime. That was just an accident. You know, you haven't heard this story, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I don't know how knives work. What am I? Like I said, I already, I already proclaimed I'm not a psycho. <laughs> I like those. I mean, I think those are good 
I love that actually. It probably pulls me in more than the cold opens that I do, but I think that they apply pretty strictly to, well, I mean, maybe not, but I think the, the place that I see them the most are in the narrative nonfictions. Uh, but I, it could probably work in a, I don't know if it could work in a solo cast. I think that would be hard because it's just you talking. <laughs> uh, but in an interview, maybe that could, I think that could work. In, in comedy, it works. I can tell you that. Mm. Can, sometimes, but sometimes it's the only funny thing <laughs> in the whole episode. And you've spoiled it. Yeah. It really makes you think of how you're going to do things, too. I think that plays a big part of it. Yeah. So, Jim, when you're doing a live show, you, you couldn't have that kind of cold open, could you? Nope. Or you, could ha- you, could, you? You could play like a best of from another show, but I don't know if that would be any good. I'm pitching Greg and then Jeff shows up and talks to him for an hour. People are going to be pissed. Jim, you're super far away from your mic, by the way. That's too bad. <laughs> we heard you. <laughs> well, I, I connected it to my Bluetooth speaker so I could hear better, and then now I'm too far away from my mic. See what happens? I'm interested in this. Uh, I'm interested in the live to podcast because for this for this podcast, I completely re-record mm. the, uh, the intros and outros and I put in mid rolls and, um, I chop it down to, um, you know, when Jeff says starts the actual show. So all of our banter beforehand. Uh, so the podcast, I, I shorten all the silences. I cut out a bunch of, you know, like if I, if I remember something that needs to be cut out, I'll cut it out. Um, so the podcast actually turns into something just a little bit different than, than the space. Well, there's a, there's another type of opening here that I think we're missing out on. You just touched on it, Greg, is the, is the post create the, the creation and post of the intro. I have a few clients or I used to have a few clients who would, uh, they wouldn't do an intro at all during the actual recording. And then they would in post, they would, now that they knew what they talked about, uh, they would say, uh, Hey, this is the host of the show. And in this episode, I talked to so-and-so about their, uh, you know, their experience in whatever to fake meat creation or something, whatever. <laughs> That's a trending topic in front of me right now. I don't just go to fake meat automatically when I can't think of things to say. But okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and uh, <laughs> sure, sure. There's a big plate of fake meat in front of me right now. Uh, and, and, and we talked about this, this, and this. We talk about their experience with blah. We talk about their time with their mother that this happened. And we talk about like, you know, this. I like those a lot. I happen, I happen to like those, I think, the most but I think they're maybe done the least because, I mean, let's be honest, as podcasters, we spend so much fucking time in post anyway, that the idea that we would want to create, you know, more in post than we already had is maybe a little unattractive to a lot of us. Yeah, as I said, that's probably where I jumped off. I wanted to do as little work as possible. So that's why I kind of just grip it and rip it. You're in, the, you're in a perfect industry for that. <laughs> Did, we, did you yeah. just say grip it and rip it? Did, is that what yep. I just heard? Yes, yep. he, yes, that's what he said. Jeez. Isn't that a condom thing? Grip it and rip it? Could be. Yeah, yeah, Eric, so Joe, you're interested to speak. We'll get sponsorships here for you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Cheap show. Go ahead. Cheap show. That's your cue. You requested to speak. You are good to speak. Um, is my microphone on now? Yeah, it's on fine. Oh, okay, wonderful. I wasn't quite sure. Hello, sorry. Um, long-time listener, first-time caller. Um, just talking about the cold open thing, how it's, I find that fascinating in that the one I, the podcast that I do, hello, by the way, my name is Paul. Um, he, my co-host, doesn't like doing the cold opens, but I do, and it was something we introduced about a year in, and I thought they were really good like scene setters for us. But I kind of understand that I think from show to show, it depends on what you want to get out of that cold open, whether you want it to be a law, whether you want it to be like uh, a scene setting thing. And I just, again, just listening in, because everyone else seems to be doing very different podcasts. Um, I just find it fascinating to chip in with kind of like that, because we also do, we did our live show recently for our 300th episode. And we did a cold open to that, but we kind of got away with that because we kind of made it seem like it was a backstage conversation before the show started. So I think there are ways to 
to kind of get people in the mood. But if your episode doesn't need it, sometimes it's just best to come in fresh and just lay it all out as the episode develops. I absolutely love the idea of kind of like this theatrical take on on the open. That's great. That it that it feels like you're listening to something that shouldn't have made it to tape. That's that's wonderful. I love that. Yeah. Well, yeah. the problem is is that my podcast is kind of a chameleon in that depending on what our mood is that week, we'll either go outside and record on the street or go for a walk, or we will make it a narrative episode with special effects and characters, or it will be a game show, or it will be a live show. Or so they kind of from week to week, it's a very different show, but it allows us to play with the forms and conventions of each. And it basically it's honestly, it just keeps us from getting bored of doing podcasting. We li- literally 300 episodes in. And, and I think one of the things that have kept us going is simply that variety that you, you don't know what it's going to be this week. It's a bit of a tombola. Wait, hold on. What did you say it was a bit of? Like a tombola. You know, like one of those things you put loads of balls into a machine, you rotate it and you pull something out like a bingo ball. Love that. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, it just that's just the kind of way we've always ran with the show because, like, without going into the weeds of it, but like it started out because me and my mate were both stand up comedians and we got bored of doing it. And we thought when you do stand up, when you're starting out, you're kind of doing material for other people. And then when they get to know you, then the material becomes a bit more about you and people come to see you for that. We found out with the podcast that we could just do what we wanted, build that audience. And then eventually it's like playing to a home crowd. You would always be in safe company with that audience or that the, that listenership because you've established your characters. And the versions that we play in the podcast are not real us. They're very exaggerated versions of us, but they kind of use to fill in holes every week. But we, we tend to find, I mean, this is the one going back to the cold open thing. I tend to find that cold open is the opening gambit to that week's episode. So if people listen in and they hear the traffic going by and me and my mate walking out in the street, they know, oh, it'll be one of those out and about episodes. If they hear a special effect or music cues or things, they go, oh, they're doing the characters thing this week. And we kind of weave that through. So I love cold opens. I think they're brilliant for what we do. But if I was doing something a bit more factual, a bit more interview based, cold open would either have to reflect what's going to happen after the credits or or have because i don't like spoilers really i think sometimes the best moments in a podcast happen because they've happened in the flow of that discussion and so to pull things out of context and dump it at the front can sometimes take away the impact of that mm. so it all it kind of really all depends i think whether you want it as a proper little you know fishing bait tackle thing or again like i said before whether you want it to set tone so that's kind of all i wanted to say so, so has anybody, the, the answer to this question is probably going to be no, but there's a, there's a French film called uh, Reversible. It was one of the first uh, foreign films I ever watched when I was a teenager. And I just thought, has anyone ever done a podcast that never even has to deal with, uh, never even has to deal with cold opens because they do the whole podcast in like reverse Tarantino style where you're getting the end of the show first and you work your way to the beginning. I wonder if that would be a fun concept or if it would be impossible to pass off on in audio oh, format. I, I do know I'm stealing that idea because I love a chat and so I'm going to try that now. <laughs> Please do it. If it's a disaster, let me know and if it's a success. Oh, I mean, if it's a disaster, that's just even better for us. There's no other show that leans into its deficiencies more than mine. I would love that. I would love to hear that just to hear how it went. All right, well, I'll put a pin in that then for now. <laughs> yeah, come back, report back with the uh, episode so we can listen to it. I definitely will do. I just wanted to say hello because I've been listening to this for months now or, or however long, and it's just I've never been able to talk at nights because I'm in the youth. So it's nice to have uh, some time and space for myself to actually say hello to everyone. Well, hello back. We appreciate you coming. Oh, well, yeah. Thanks for your continued support. No, 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 it's all good. It's all good. Because I, I mean, I, from my point of view, the UK is kind of its own little thing. And like half of our battle has been to try and, uh, you know, broach America. And we've been fortunate to some extent that I think a lot of our growth came from working with you in the UK and America. And that audience fed into ours quite nicely. But it's it's interesting to listen to your side of the industry because... It's all kind of, a, don't get me wrong, we're all playing on the same thing about building audiences, growing audiences, and making this up in some respects. But we've been very lucky with our Patreon 
that we don't need to worry about advertising. But at the same time, we also know advertising is tricky for us because our show is about living cheaply. So we can't halfway through an episode where we're talking about Dollar Tree type stuff to go, oh, and here's Casper Mattress because it doesn't correlate. So we're always having to play that game. So to listen to kind of this side of the discussion seems foreign to me in more ways than one, but it, it does open my ears to how things are developed and, and how growth happens uh, across the water. It's good to know that Casper mattress uh, mattresses are an invasion, an invasive species of mattresses that they've made it across the sea to annoy oh, all of you yeah. as well. I'm tired of skipping adverts for things I can't even order in this country if I even wanted them. But <laughs> <laughs> like, hello, fresh. Yes, one day. Maybe that'd be nice. But for now, it's not happening. So um, cheap sheets, uh, cheap seat seat. You said that you're in uh, in the UK. So this show is starting at like 2 a.m. for you, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm a night owl, right? So I'm usually editing this time of night anyway when everyone else like, in the noise gone to bed. Well, I just want to show you my respect because uh, that's some dedication to listen to the show every day. I couldn't do that. <laughs> oh, no, I'll be up for hours. I'm tinkering with lots of patron stuff now because, you know, it's the, again, it's that kind of time of the day. No one's around. I can have you guys on in the background sometimes while I'm editing, which is kind of discombobulating, but it's fine. It's good. I just don't want to lose out in the conversation. That's dedication, Greg. I know. I love it. All right. So back to uh, the cold open for a second. How, how long does everyone think that they give a podcast before you switch it off? Like for, for a net new podcast or even a podcast that you normally listen to, um, if you click on an episode, how long do you give it before you give up on it typically? Can, can we do like a fun correlation with this though for anybody who answers? Can we say you have to answer two questions? The one Greg just asked, but also like to what extent does a restaurant need to mess up for you to complain? Because I will finish an episode I hate. And I'm also the kind of guy that if I was going to complain at a restaurant, you'd have to bring me a frozen fish when I ordered a steak in order for me to even say anything about it. I'll just suffer through it. So I'll almost never abandon anything I started. Ugh. Okay. Well, we should teach um, you how, how to abandon you, stuff. You should, uh, you should uh, <laughs> translate that over to all the stuff you do on the creative part. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. So go ahead. Ed. Sorry. So, I, now, I, I want to double into this though, because like if I'm passively listening to a podcast, like it's on in the background, like he was talking about editing and doing stuff around the house. It's on. Like I'm just going to leave it on. But if I'm driving or somewhere where, you know, like it's more accessible to flip because I'm not interested, boy, it, it, it gets bad at times under five minutes. I feel like I'm prone to fast forward before just giving up. Like if something's just bothering me, I fast forward a little bit and go from there. Maybe that's odd. I don't know. <laughs> Steve sounds like an idiot. Let's give him 60 more seconds. Should we try to go to Ed again? He's got his hand up. Go. Hey, Ed. What's going go on? Go ahead, Ed. Ed one, not Ed two. Ed two is next. Anyway, I was going to say, I usually give a new podcast about three minutes um, before uh, straight before I'll start skipping through every 30 seconds. Uh, but if, if they don't get to the point by 10 minutes, I, I tap out because, uh, you know, if I'm listening to if I'm giving a, a podcaster a chance, I'm doing it because I think they're talking about a topic I'm interested in. And if they don't get to the point right away, if they're just going to be bantering because they're buddies and they, um, they just got to do their shtick before I, I'm, I'm not, you know, if I was a long time listener, maybe that's a different thing, but there needs to be a balance between, you know, the, the stuff that buddies do when buddies do their shows and just getting to the damn point, because that's what we're all here for eventually. You know, it's one of the things I love about Tanner's shows is that some of them are two minutes long. Some of them are six minutes long. He never almost never goes over 15 minutes. He just gets to the damn point. Uh, his commercials are super short usually. Um, but that's one of the things I like about Tanner's shows in general is just that he, he doesn't have time for, for the BS. He just gets to the point because he respects his listeners. And uh, as a listener, I respect that. 
other Thanks, than man. Appreciate other that. than them being cheap bastards, he respects them. <laughs> They're not free, cheap. My show's free, paid only now. Freeloaders. He doesn't. He, he doesn't BS. He just gets to the BS quicker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's. God, I love you guys, and I hate that's you at right. the same time. He's like, he, he, you're good. I, I'll, I'll be your friend for five dollars and forty cents a month. <laughs> Oh, freedom See, is free, was, right? If it was five dollars, I'd pay. But that extra forty cents, man. Oh, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's not round numbers. Can't do it. I gotta go get to the, the su- supercast. Gotta get its cut. No, no. Let's go to the greatest song. The greatest song ever sung poorly. Another Ed. What's up, Ed? You got it right, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> there's a calculus to it. So, <laughs> for some shows, I will listen through things that I'm not enjoying. Uh, particularly if uh, there are people I like. But the thing that makes me turn stuff off quickly is uh, audio quality. So if it's an interview show and one half of it is sounding really bad and I'm not interested, then I'm going to either skip ahead or just go to the next show and just delete that one. And as far as the restaurant thing goes, the only thing I ever complain about is if 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 I order a steak rare and I get it above medium, then I'll complain. Any other time I'm like, nah, I'll eat this. It's fine. Oh, yeah. I so, forgot to answer the, the restaurant question. Oh, yeah. Go back to Ed. Other Ed. Ed so for the rest, for, for Tanner, the restaurant question, um, I won't complain. I just will, uh, if the food's not good, I just won't eat it. And that'll be the indication to the, the restaurant operator that um, I, I was not happy with the quality of the food. But um, it, it takes it takes quite a bit. I've got... I've got very low standards when it comes to food uh, for the most part. As long as it's edible and has some taste, I'm okay with it. But it has to be really bad for me to, to not even eat it. But uh, I'm, I'm passive. I'm not passive aggressive enough to complain. I'll just leave the food there and, and let them figure it out for them damn selves. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are podcasters or rather are waiters just the podcasters of the food industry? Because the reason that I don't, complain at a restaurant unless there's severe circumstances is probably the same reasons I never leave a one-star review. I'm like, these guys have a shit job. (laughs) They don't want to deal with me complaining. They sure as shit don't want to go talk to the cook to deal with him throwing a hissy fit because they brought back a plate. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some, I think there's some, uh, some it absolutely de- it depends on the plate, though. I mean, if you order a steak rare and they give it to you medium well, that's so far afield from what you actually ordered that maybe then you send it back. But if they give it to you like medium or medium rare and you ordered it rare, eh, close enough, I'll eat it. Dude, if I ordered a rare steak and they brought me a chicken, I would just shut up and eat it. It depends on how good the chicken is. They're thinking about your health, Tanner. You're go- you, you would get that chicken and go, yeah, you were right. I need this. All right, gentlemen, I've got to leave now. It's time to go to the movie. So uh, have a great rest of the uh, broadcast. Take care. See you later, Ed one. Uh, so next time anybody's picking out a podcast, just go to your phone and screen record the process and come back to it after and just see what your manner mannerisms are, your, your, you know, what you're doing. Um, I did that. I was recently looking for a sci-fi show, um, you know, something I personally would like. And I give it between three minutes and five minutes typically if you go by my screen recording. And uh, I also noticed that I choose things primarily based on the cover art. So, um, you know, I don't know what that says about me, but. uh, Do you also shop by color in the cereal aisle (laughs) at the supermarket? No, I have people that do that. Oh, oh that, that's right. Your podcast. I forgot how much money we all have. Yeah, <laughs> to go outside. So. Yeah, no, I, I, my legs would get chilly if I went out there. Now, this is an interesting discussion, and I, I think, and I'm always the guy to say this, but one thing you don't want to do is overcomplicate this whole thing that we're talking about as well. No, and finding so, listeners is already hard enough. Like, um, you know don't subject them to the nonsense because they're hard to, they're hard to find. They're hard to get the, if you think about the things that have to happen for a listener to come to your show, I mean, it's a wonder anybody has any listeners. 
is it possible for us to, and I don't know if we want to get into this because we're already at our hour and I know we always go over by half hour because that's kind of the expectation at this point. But I had an interesting conversation about uh, quote unquote podcast critics, like as in you have a professional food critic, you have a professional movie critic. Why don't we have professional podcast critics? And there seem to be a contingent of individuals whom are writing about podcasts on a regular basis and are trying to um, le- legitimate maybe th- their existence as as critics, people who would do that as a living. Uh, what do we think about critics in podcasting? I, I for one, see a benefit. I also see an annoyance, but I think that's true in any situation where you have critics. You hate them until they love you and then you love them. Um, but what do you guys think about that? Is that worth talking about? I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump on this and say you suck first and foremost. (laughs) And, uh, been a while since I said that, uh, but here's the problem. How do they make money doing that? Because that's the end game for all of this. Well, that's exactly right. I love that question. How does a, and I'm genuinely asking this, I don't know the answer. How does a film critic make money? How does, uh, and I know that these are much more developed industries than podcasting, but podcasting has, I mean, I think. At this point, the advertising in podcasting is approaching $3 billion a year. I think that's close. Brian will probably DM me and tell me if I'm right or wrong about that. But it, it's quite a lot of money. And I know that those other industries, restaurant industry and the film industry, are much more developed. But podcasting is getting there. Uh, so h- how do film critics make money? How do restaurant critics make money? Well, I have one example here. Um, it's not a great one, but um, I have a YouTube channel called Greg Reviews Sci-Fi. It's something I put on hold to start indie dropping, you know, because of you know the the pandemic. I wanted to do something to help podcasters. But anytime I would I would use affiliate links. This is why I love affiliate advertising. So anytime I would review a book, if the review was positive, I would sell about a hundred books. So. And my YouTube channel only has like 1,500 subscribers, something like that. So imagine if I had 150,000, how many books I would sell when I did a review. So that's that was the monetization strategy for that one. Uh, I know that, that a lot of uh, publishers will pay for a review. And, you know, I've been offered uh, uh, an upwards of like 500 bucks for my tiny little YouTube channel to, to do a review. So... I think there's lots of ways, but that was how I did it. So, so is it un, unreasonable to think that, you know, if, if you're going to be a professional podcaster, obviously there's a lot involved in that. Then if you're just a, an, uh, let's say a hobbyist or an enthusiast is the word I've learned to use because some people don't like the word hobbyist. But is it unreasonable to think that it could be a profitable industry for some people who wanted to take it to the level of, okay, I'm going to review your podcast and I also have a book all about podcasting or all about production. Like, is that unreasonable? Could that industry no, not exist? Maybe, maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump flip the Greg here. Isn't that kind of what you do with the indie drop-in to a degree when you're putting these shows together, kind of being a correct? Because I'm, I'm sure you're not taking them all. Yeah, no, I, I don't take them all. But um, I try to keep my, uh, you know, what someone likes is very subjective. So um, I, it, it's more of a, does it, it you know, are they... Have, have they been a podcaster for three months? Is their sound figured out? Like, are they, do they have an edited show? Do they have an intro? So sorry, Jim, but uh, just kidding. Um, so what I try to do is just make sure the hygiene is, you know, what I'll call like third grader podcast hygiene, right? Like you've got the basics figured out. Uh, you have a show that makes sense to somebody when they first listen to it, because every single listener that listens to an episode that's on my show, that's the very first time they're hearing that podcast and that's the episode that they're hearing. So it, it better be the best foot forward. So those are the things I look for. Is it the best foot forward? Um, is there a good chance that I'll be able to convert, um, which my conversion rate is about 10%, which is pretty amazing. I think, um, so uh, Brian, again, just, I think he's busy with family probably, so he's communicating through through DM, but he's uh, told me that other critics make money as, I'm reading directly, part of publication, newspapers, magazines, websites. It's content that draws to the bigger media site that has ads and other things to sell. It's content. And he gives the example of uh, crime writers 
on and then ellipses so on, on a specific podcast and and that is by a, a woman named uh, rebecca lavoie somebody is not on mute and i think they're dying uh <laughs> so so i mean i think there's i kind of like the idea of of critics I, I mean i think it would be i think it would be fucking pretty cool and if i'm not mistaken i think brian just brought somebody onto the uh onto the sounds profitable team who i want to say is a podcast critic i can't remember the gentleman's name but I'm sure he'll he'll message me here in a minute and tell me. Uh, but I like the idea of uh, I like the idea of critics. I think how how could it hurt? Can't it can't hurt? Um, you can look at like slash film. That's a good uh, you know review critic uh, kind of independent site. I'm sure they do okay. Uh, that person's name was Gavin Gaddens, by the way. Uh, is the person who's uh... go ahead and do. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to bring in the same complication that I brought uh, when I when Tanner had this in his uh, now dead Discord. But there's different, <laughs> there's, there's different types of criticism. There's the criticism that is, you know, your Roger Ebert thumbs up, thumbs down type of thing that's designed to get somebody to either engage with or not engage with something. But there's also the kind that, like, takes a thoughtful look at things. And I think in some cases actual podcast critics are happening in the podcasting space already. Like people who are talking about, well, there is this trend among this genre of show. There is this, there is that you could have like really thoughtful, well done criticism of a more academic nature, but that's also harder to a monetize and b use as some kind of marketing thing. But no matter what, I mean, criticism is its own thing it's a valid thing. And I think the fact that there's not a lot of criticism in like a broad sense of podcasts, both in a commercial and academic setting is kind of a thing that we're missing out on as a thing, as a podcasting thing. Like, and I said in Tanner's thing too, like I wish Dave Jackson was on this one because when it comes to like the advice on making your stuff better, that was like some of the best money that I ever spent was doing podcast rodeo show. Like I, I was like, yes, no, I, I love th th This is exactly what I needed to hear in the way that I needed to hear it. And that's one type of criticism, but I could, I could also see the need for like a Pauline Kale of podcasting. Uh, just to that point, um, I was going to suggest, well, it seems to me like when I see reviews of podcasts in the UK, if it's a comedy podcast, the newspaper or website's critic will just be the comedy critic. If it's a food podcast, they will have the food critic review that podcast. So they're not so much reviewing the form of podcast. They're reviewing the wheelhouse within that, pod, within that podcast playhouse. So it feels like you're kind of reaching out to people to review your show who know your content of your show but maybe not understand podcasting. But a lot of people in the UK still review podcasting like it's radio. So you'll get a lot of um, shows reviewed simply because they're spin-offs of Radio 4 shows or uh, independent radio station stuff. So it feels like there's no such thing properly yet as a YouTube uh, a podcast critic, but whatever you play in is what they'll review. And also you've got the instance of like, where is your audience? Where are they going to get their reviews from and if your audience is mostly online and maybe they like youtube and maybe they get involved with twitch or whatever as well they're probably going to search for people in those forms who review those things and get that reflection and when you get to that point you're then dealing with well with that critics on youtube they're dealing with the algorithm they're dealing with the stats and trying to monetize off their own end so that's how it feels like to me is that people are still reviewing within their niche rather than seeing podcasting as a form of itself. And that's more a structural review when people look at the form of it itself and how people are using that to make their show. Yeah. You know what? I should have probably been clear and maybe I've made an assumption that everybody would think what I, what I was thinking, but when I'm thinking of podcast critique, I'm not thinking of structure or production. I mean, I guess that would necessarily production probably have to be part of it. Uh, but I'm thinking of, of review of the critique of the actual content, the quality of what's being said the, in the same way that you don't review the, I mean, you'd review the aesthetic of a restaurant, whether or not it's inviting, but a lot of a food critique is not about the building, but about the, uh, but about the thing that you're putting in your mouth. Uh, and this kind of crosses over with a conversation I was having 
uh, with Keelan, who's an independent podcast critic. You can find her here on Twitter at I am Keelan it, uh, K-E-E-L-I-N-I-T. Uh, and she's, a, she's an independent podcast critic. And, and earlier today she was talking about, um, she was talking about the idea of f- finding a way to like rate podcasts on their, um, not legitimacy, that's probably the wrong word, but kind of like Snopes will make sure something is true or if it's not true. Some sort of rating system that suggested the qualifications of the individual who was opining on a certain topic. Like imagine you're a you're somebody who has a philosophy podcast. Well, what are your credentials as a philosopher? Or you're somebody who has a news podcast. Well, what exactly are your credentials on a and and I thought she meant, well, we should have this thing that prevents people who aren't qualified from creating podcasts. And I was like, well, that'll go over like a lead balloon. That's not a good idea. Uh, but what she was getting at more like was kind of like movie ratings or television ratings, how you have, you know, it'll say TVMA or TV PG 13 or something, but, it, but it'll be a judgment of like a news networks. Um, uh, what is the word when you're not biased? What's, what's the, what's the other word? Help me help, help. Nobody new, new, neutrality, I neutrality. Yeah. Yeah. The neutrality well, of the of the news. I thought that was interesting. I think it kind of crosses over with criti- with this criticism idea because you might be able to get both through, through the former. I, I know that, that I found it really strange sometimes to read a review of a podcast that usually stars someone who uh, is a well-known celebrity or they're certainly well-known. They're a stand up, they're a TV show host. And the review would be really fine and say the content's good. But when I hear the actual podcast, the audio quality is awful. I think I remember someone recommending a mini driver podcast and the whole thing was recorded on their iPhone with their earbuds in and it sounded garbage, but they gave it a great review because it kind of decided to put front and center the content. So that's when you get this disconnect between, well, they're not reviewing the quality, but they are reviewing the quality of that person's input into the podcast. And I sometimes think, a lot of these shows get away with murder just because of that uh, association with some kind of fame or some kind of standing already. It, it's the it's the same here. The same thing happens here. We have celebrities that launch podcasts all the time that are terrible. You've made me very sad because with that story, you've just reminded me that I that when I was younger, I, I really liked the movie um, Gross Point Blank and Minnie Driver was w- one of the main protagonists in that story. And I had the biggest crush on her. And now you've, you've ruined her for me. <laughs> No, this is just, apparently she's wonderful. So I think it's just because someone said, here's a load of money to make a podcast. And she went, how do I record it? And they went, we'll get a producer to take the audio off your phone. We'll do the rest. And she went, all right, great. Oh no. <laughs> Poor mini driver. Yeah, bless her. But I, again, I, I've been in that situation because I work in radio in the UK and I've been in rooms where a presenter will walk into the production studio and go, oh, I've been offered a podcast today. I don't know what the fuck that is but they've offered me X amount of money to do it for a couple of episodes. And it all just seems so dis- you know, like a waste of money and time if these people don't seem to... I'm basically venting my anger right now for no real reason. But it is that weird thing where a lot of... kind of, I would say poor quality shows get a pass, and it makes it harder for smaller independent podcasts to be taken seriously when that's what they've got to compete against, which gets the numbers, but also kind of uh, weakens what a podcast can be, which is basically not radio. Yeah. Uh, Gary, I see you up here, and I know you have some pretty strong opinions on this, so so let's hear them. Well, they're not strong. I just, when people talk about, like, Pauline Kale or uh, Roger Ebert, the only reason they mattered is because they had a platform. Pauline Kale wrote for the Washington Post. Roger Ebert wrote for the Chicago Sun-Times and had a syndicated television show. That's why they mattered. So unless a reviewer has a big platform that a lot of people pay attention to, they're just a listener. Uh, I don't know if a lot of you know about a guy named James Bernardini. He's been an independent film reviewer for 20 years. And he's really good. And almost nobody knows about him. Even though he's been doing it for 20 years, he's, he's on Rotten Tomatoes and stuff. But, uh, but because he's not in a major magazine or a newspaper, no one cares. And... The other difference is if you're a food reviewer, a music reviewer, a movie reviewer, these are all decisions that a consumer has to spend money on, right? Am I going to buy this ticket? Am I going to spend money on a meal? With a podcast, I can recommend a podcast to you now, and you can be listening to it within two minutes at no cost to you. 
and you can evaluate for yourself within a matter of seconds whether this is something you're going to want to listen to. So if people want to be podcast reviewers, go nuts. I just don't think there's going to be much value for it. And the other thing is that I can eat out dozens of times a year, same with going to movies, but most people only listen to seven to eight podcasts. And so the, the room for demand for new shows, I just don't think is there. I think a lot of this is people who like podcasting and they want to talk about it, but they don't have a podcast themselves and it's a way for them to be involved. But unless the New York Times hires a podcast reviewer, I just don't see it taken off. So first of all, thank you for making us all sad to remind us that all of our shit is free and nobody listens to us. God damn it, Gary. <laughs> You've made us all weep tonight. Uh, but but I think that that's all, everything you just said is, I mean, that's fair. I think that's an opinion you can have and you can probably back up everything you just said. Well, I mean, time's going to prove it one way or the other. Um, right. I, I just don't see a lot of demand for it. I think there's people that would like to do it, but I don't see a lot of people saying, uh, boy, I wish there was someone who would tell me what podcast to listen to. You can go to Apple and read reviews. And, and get a, you know, if someone, if a site has or a show has hundreds of reviews, uh, you know, that's no different than Yelp. A lot of more people use Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb nowadays or uh, Metacritic than they do individual film reviewers. So they look at, you know, the totality of reviews and we can already get that with podcasting. So I don't know what a single person is going to bring to the table. Maybe if they had a specialization for like fiction podcasts, um, I could see that. But I don't know how you do a fiction podcast and a history podcast and a celebrity gossip interview podcast. They're, they're just different beasts. They may be in the realm of a podcast, but they're, they're just, you know, I don't trust someone that does rock and roll reviews to review classical music, even though they're both music. Yeah, again, I think all that is all that is a fair take on it. Uh, back to you, Jeff or Greg. Well, I mean, this has been an interesting conversation where, like Tanner said, always going over. Does anybody else have anything to say before we put a book in on this one? I think that anybody who wants to review a podcast, go for it, put it on a website, and maybe one or two people will use you as a discovery mechanism and we'll get one or two listeners. I think it can only help. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, right. Like, who who are we to piss on the idea, right? I mean, at some point, people thought podcasting was stupid. People thought blogging was stupid. Plenty of people have really big blogging platforms now, and all they do is write about one thing. Um, so I don't think anybody up here is trying to poo-poo. I think it's just a, a smattering of different opinions on it. I, I'm pro. Gary's kind of, I wouldn't say Gary's anti. I would say he's doesn't see the practicality of it and would like to see it play out. Um if it's something you want to do and you're passionate about it, you should do it and find out. Yeah. I think the world always needs like, especially spe the specialization comment, the, the world always needs people that are good at stuff. And if you're a, a, a retired reporter, you know, that wants to, you know, work uh, 10 hours a week and critique true crime podcasts, you probably bring a lot of value to the genre. Um, you know, if you're a comedian, and you want to put a PG rating on comics for kids or G rating or something like that and build a website for comics for kids. I think there's a lot of value in that. Those are just two things that just popped in my head here, but um, the world is big. Opportunities are endless. And I don't, I don't, I think if you're, if you're, uh, if you want to, if you're into something, there's probably an audience out there that will uh, pay you uh, for your information. I will say this, even if there were no podcast critics in the world, we all mostly have mothers. And every week I find out from my mother exactly what she thinks of my latest episode. And she mostly says she wish it, there was less swearing in it. So that's my weekly feedback. So at least I've got that. <laughs> when the queen passed, was she like, of this week, of all weeks, you couldn't tone it down? <laughs> the horrible thing is, is that... <laughs> My podcast has this curse. We will mention someone on the episode, and then within two or three weeks, they die. And that happened a few weeks ago when we mentioned the Queen on our podcast. So now my mum's blaming me for it. Tanner, stay away from that podcast. <laughs> uh, there's some. Maybe some people would want you to mention me next week. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, please, please mention me. Yeah. 
drop me a line or I'll create a death notebook of everyone who wants to be axed. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's ridiculous. We'll go into some closing thoughts here. Uh, I think mine is, I didn't realize that Byron Barletta was sponsoring everything that Tanner did. So congratulations on the new sponsorship, Tanner. Man, couldn't have plugged him any better tonight. Greg, what about you? What do you think? You're the one that was the mastermind of these this topic. Well, honestly, a lot of the topics. So well done. Oh, thanks. Uh, you know, I like talking about podcasting. And I just think that if you're... You should be a critic. Yeah, I am a critic, but I just keep it to myself like every uh, proper person should. The... Uh, you know, when you're, when you're building your podcast, just think about the basics, right? Every, every, every industry, every job has basics. So before you reinvent the wheel, at least get the basics down and then you can iterate and put your own fingerprint on things. Unless you have like a crazy idea, like pod cube or something like that. But uh, you know, if you're a, a podcaster that's just talking about wrestling you know, open the show with the name of the show and who the hell you are and what you're going to talk about today. I promise you there are worse ways to do it. Okay, that's it. Jimmy Mallard. Okay, so I heard Greg talk about this and now I'm interested because he bases his listenership off podcast cover art. So I think we need to do a deep dive at some point here in the future about art and what people are looking for. Not really a good final thing. I agree. I know a guy. There's a guy, so we can we can make that happen, Jim. Yeah, I doubt it. It'll probably get scrubbed for something else. So have somebody else on. We'll forget <laughs> about it, but... uh, all right, Tanny, what do you got? <laughs> Jimmy, Tanny, Greggy. All right, Jeffy. Uh, thanks for having me. Same as every week. Uh, this room and. Everything else is sponsored by Brian Barletta of soundsprofitable.com. It's not, but I'm going to say that just to upset Jeff. I think he got a hair across his ass about that. So everybody be sure to go to soundsprofitable.com and subscribe to their uh, ad tech newsletter. Love it. Take us home, Greg. Take us home. Thanks, everybody, for coming to Podcasting Power Hour. You can get this recording and all of the recordings at podcastingpowerhour.com we are caught up as of tonight so no way should, yeah man yeah man oh and by the way i'm using a new ai transcription tool that actually got jeffy t from last week correct if you can believe that crap really yeah 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 that's pretty nuts that's accurate. so yeah yeah it's pretty good so Did again i create it no, that one is not sponsored by Brian. Okay. Um, yet. So Soon we'll enough. see. I'll probably hear it on Pod News. He'll be buying it or something. Yeah. <laughs> that that and Good Morning Podcasters, apparently. Yep. Yep. I know. Groundbreaking news. You heard it first here. No, but seriously, though, I've been sick for over a month. So I appreciate everybody putting up with me. It's like once you get COVID, it just never leaves. It's insane. But some of you show up every week, and that's incredible. And we will be back next week. Not sure if we're going to have a guest or not, but regardless, it'll be the same old crew, I'm sure. So see you all next week. Thank you for listening to the Podcasting Power Hour. Everyone is free to participate on Twitter Spaces every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. To join, just follow Jeff at podcast underscore father or Greg at Indie Dropin. If you found this podcast helpful, go into your podcast app and write a quick review. Other podcasters will see it and know this show is worth listening to. Also, I'll put a few links in the show notes for ways you can support the show. I think by now you know we love our coffee. Have a great week. We're still here. <laughs> this goes. This is actually six more hours. <laughs> uh, actually, Jeff, on that note, do you want me to talk to uh, the guys at Glassbox and see if I could have them on to kind of chit chat about networks? If, if that's if there's any value there. Yeah, I mean that, that's fine with me. What about you, Greg? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I, I'm willing to have anybody on. I mean, they can uh, just come to any any week, honestly, and 
Um, or if you want to do something formal, we can too. Oh, no, it doesn't have to be. I mean, I know you guys just kind of let people, there's no sponsorship or anything like that, but but if you're interested, I could I could do that. And have we had JJ come up as like the the guest ever? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. JJ's been oh, on. Good. Ken's been on. Yeah, Ken was the week that, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, JJ, I'm, I think if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to see you uh, later next week. So I look forward to that. And uh, you guys, bye. See you, Tanner. Bye, Tanner. See you. It's awesome you got them all caught up, Greg. That's, that's not an easy task. No, no, I was, uh, I'm waiting for the, trans- uh, the transcript to the last one, but it's uploaded. I just have to hit submit. Um, the, uh, um, and then I, f- I found a way. Uh, so, Jeff. Um, don't forget to request from Twitter the the spaces because I want to hear how the audio if the audio is any different. Okay. Yeah. But uh, but what I found is if I record from the computer, it's higher quality audio than if I record from the phone. I mean, it makes sense logically, but not really because it's still Twitter spaces either way. No, I know for sure what you're saying. Yeah, it makes a difference. Just too bad you can't talk from the yeah. computer yet. Yeah, I know it's a pain. Like I have to go in and copy the link and then paste it into Twitter and then open it up and hit play, but and then record it on the roadcaster. And so that's why it takes me so long to do it because uh, I actually have to like replay the episode into the roadcaster and then you know, but we'll see if the download how the download sounds. I mean that's how that's how Pixie does it. And I listened to her show, and it doesn't sound too bad. It sounds like the same as what she sounds like in the space. Fair enough. All right. On that note, I'm going to jump off here. And I'm old, you know. It's it's 10:30 here. I gotta I gotta get in my beauty sleep. Dude, me too. Me too. I'm sorry that you've been sick for so long. That's that, that's yeah. uh. So I just like doing podcasting right there. I feel like shit for over a month. I mean, it's insane. I don't know. Jim, do you hear your duck noises? I feel like I didn't get any play for that. You just Uh, ignored them. You know, (laughs) the funny part is when you when you did that, I thought there was two minutes left because back in the day, I had uh, (laughs) so I have a track that has the intro music and the outro music, so it stays an hour long. And back in the day, I had somebody who did it for me, and they threw duck quacking at two minutes left, so I wouldn't go over. So I, I thought the show was over pretty quickly there. Like it triggered that emotion. Like we're almost that done. That is amazing. Guys. That is amazing. <laughs> well, just know that I was thinking about you in a, in some sort of weird, strange way to mess with you earlier today. So that's yeah, the result. That, that, that's it's like it was like that opposite episode of The Office where Jim conditioned Dwight for the mint when he turned his computer on. <laughs> yes, and I heard yes. the duck quack, and I'm like, the show's almost over. <laughs> The office was amazing for so many reasons. And that's one of them, how he would just, when he put the quarters in his phone and then took them all out, like just, just it's amazing. Yeah. You gave me some good ideas here, Jim. You better watch okay. out. Well, that's fine. I'm here for it. All right. Talk to you later, Jeff. See you everybody. Hey, Bye-bye. See you.